Uh, so now we have uh, the panel about uh, Bergson and uh, spiritualism. And I think uh, the first ones uh, we talk are Tis van Gemert and uh, Johan Elland. Um, may I? Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, before introducing those two speakers, um, I would like, first of all, to um, express my gratitude towards uh, Mathilde and the University of Toulouse and say that I um, I'm happy with the kind of collaboration we have now with the University of Toulouse, thanks to Charles Wolf also. And I, I don't know whether it was mentioned, but um, uh, I think uh, this collaboration for me at least started with a research project at the University of Ghent um, about vitalism, a counter history of biology, which uh, studies vitalism in, in the kind of, um, perhaps not a montage way, but uh, as a kind of um, assuming the figure of the negativity. It's a counter history of biology and there are lots of things to say indeed epistemologically, axiologically, um, uh, regarding the theory of nature. Um, so I, I would wish that in the future we could continue this collaboration. And the second thing I wanted to say is um, I thank Mathilde in particular for the, the big effort she has done in co-organizing this event. And um, it, at one point, it was also the initiative of Emily Herring, and I regret that she is not here today. And I regret she um, decided in some sense not to uh, continue her academic work in this fashion. So um, let me introduce to you the first uh, couple of speakers, um, Dies van Hemert and Johan, Johan Eland. I, I say it in the Dutch way. Um, Dies van Hemert studied psychology, cultural studies and philosophy at Tilburg University and Erasmus University and is currently working as a PhD student, uh, researcher at the Tilburg Center of Moral Philosophy epistemology and philosophy of science. And uh, his PhD project is on who is afraid of psychology, reconstructing and reconsidering the psychologism debate. John Eland is antiquarian, that's what I got from you, and administrator of the Hypnose Library in Sertogenbosch. He published on hypnosis, uh, translated two books by Anthony Madrid, and wrote a book on the relation between hypnosis, mirror neurons, and oxytocin. So I welcome you, please, for 20 minutes, and then afterwards, another 20 minutes lecture and 20 minutes discussion for both after that on Bergson and spiritualism. Spiritualism, you have the floor. I don't know who. So, yeah. So I'll present. Can I share my screen, Matilda? Hello. Uh, I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So can you see my slides and hear me? Yeah, okay, so I will start. So uh, yesterday, Sebastian and Charles, they commented on the interdisciplinary nature of uh, Bergson's work, Creative Evolution, and they emphasized that we should not only take into account biology when reading this work, but also the medicine and psychology of the time. So that's what I'm going to try to do. I will focus on a topic that lies in between medicine and psychology, psycho-research. So while there has been some work on Bergson's relation to psycho-research, I think a fully developed uh, historical account is still missing. And in this talk, I will give you the sketches of what I'm working on. Uh, so trying to map this in detail. Yeah, I cannot present everything due to lack of time, but I will give you the most important details so that we can see how this leads us to transform our reading of uh, Bergson's work. Okay, now another note on um, Bergson's, uh, of the discussion we had concerning vitalism and spiritualism yesterday. While I think it's possible to give readings of creative evolution that detach Bergson from the problematic aspects of vitalism and spiritualism, like Tano and Matilde did, um, I think that if we study Bergson's views on psycho-research, 
it becomes clear that a lot of these problematic aspects of vitalism come in there and that he endorses views that are closely related to that of Dries. Um, so this will become apparent later on. Um, now, another general note, I think in a way it should not surprise us that many French spiritualists in the philosophical sense of the word were uh, not only committed to affirming the existence of spirit, but also inclined to accept the results of psycho research and spiritism in general. Yeah? I will argue that Bergson's philosophical views are intertwined with his interest in topics such as hypnosis, hyperesthesia, telepathy, and life after death. Yeah? So Bergson will be my case study, but in a way, I think we can make similar uh, cases for Boutreau and Fourier, who are also on record for testing their belief in telepathy, for example. Okay. So structure of my talk, first, I'll give a brief overview of Bergson's early work on hypnosis and hyperesthesia. Um, then I will reconstruct a re reception of this work. So uh, there has not been much on the reception of Bergson's uh, early work on hypnosis, but uh, I found some references together with Johan that allow us to uh, show that Bergson was actually well known among these researchers before being known as a philosopher yeah okay and then i'll say something about bergson's attendance of the seances of paladino and then i'll use this historical background to give a reading of uh, phantoms of life and psychic research of course i cannot take into uh, into account bergson's other works when giving this reading but i think it gives us enough fruit for discussion and yeah and uh uh, con considerations for uh, the discussion that we've already had. And then I'll just briefly conclude. Okay, so Bergson, uh, uh, Bergson hypnosis and hyperesthesia. So I think that um, Bergson's interest in psycho research can be traced back all the way to the beginning of his career, because the very first publication by Bergson, as some of you might know, was a book that extensively discussed hypnosis. Um, in 1883, he published a translation of James Sully's Illusion, uh, A Psychological Study. So the book you see on the left. Now, importantly, this translation appeared anonymously. Now, we can only guess the reasons for this, but I think one of the reasons is that uh, hypnosis was a controversial topic at the time and that an early career researcher like Bergson might have some second doubts about writing on such a topic at this point in his career. Okay, so then uh, what we know from Soulez and Grongain, we know that Bergson took part in meetings devoted to hypnosis uh, at his time at Clermont with the physician Moulin. Um, then he also contracted the habit of reading psycho research, so papers and books. We know that he was reading Frederick Myers and Frank Potmore, who were two influential members of the British Society of the Psycho Research, and he was reading other books, but I will restrict to these two examples. Now, this early passion resulted in a lifelong habit of reading books and journals on psycho research. This is confirmed by his uh, in his presidential address at the BSPR, so British Society for Psycho Research, uh, affirmed by his loan history and is clear from his correspondence. Now, eventually this early reading and the meetings at Moulin's home led to his own research on the topic. And in July 1886, together with a certain Robinet, he did an, a hypnosis experiment with two adolescent boys. The results were published in November 1886 in Revue Philosophique de la France de l'Étranger, a journal where much discussion on psycho research had already taken place by Richet and Bonnet, for example, who were also uh, authors that Bergson was reading at the time. Now, Bergson begins the article by noting that he had learned from a Dr. V, once again, somebody who stays anonymous, so this is characteristic, I would say, about experiments where there's someone reading a book on the one side of the room, so take a look at the picture in the middle, and another hypnotized person on the other side of the room, yeah, so the person in front, who is asked on what page the book is opened. So the idea is that if somebody is hypnotized, that person is able to receive some thoughts from the experimenter. Now, according to Bergson, the experiment of Dr. V showed that this was possible and that the uh, hypnotized, hypnotized persons could name the pages of the book. 
Now, Bearson basically wanted to replicate these findings. And indeed, after he had hypnotized the boys, they, want, they could uh, tell Bergson and Robinet on what page the book was opened. Now, uh, crucially, Bergson did not explain this finding by a sixth sense or telepathy, which were the common explanations of the time. So uh, other people explained these findings in this way, but he explained it by hyperesthesia. According to him, uh, hypnosis effectuates um, hyperesthesia and these boys become so sensitive to sensory input that they are able to read the page number in the cornea, like you see on the picture, of the researcher. So their eyes have become extremely sensitive. Now, to test this, he did an, ex an additional experiment where he asked uh, subjects to, uh, to, to tell him what, uh, what certain microscopic photos presented. So you see them on the right. These were very tiny photos that could only be uh, yeah, made visible with a microscope. But according to Bergson, because these boys were hypnotized, they were able to do that without a microscope. Their bare eyes could tell, uh, yeah, gave them uh, enough input so that they could reconstruct what was on the photos. Okay, so Bergson ends this article with arguing that this explanation, hyperesthesia, can also account for previous findings by Richet, Janet, and Bounès. They did similar experiments. I can say something about that in the discussion if you want. But in sum, Bergson does use his hyperesthesia to explain cases of telepathy or clairvoyance. Now, a lot of researchers have concluded from this that Bergson was thus skeptical of psycho research from the start, but I think this is not uh, the case because he is clear near the end of the argument uh, of the article, and I quote, cases of mental suggestion, so this is a, you can roughly take this as thought transference, have been observed by competent and critical researchers. Therefore, it seems difficult to contest their existence. Yeah, so he's clear these phenomena are real. Now, after the article appeared, Bergson received a reprimand from the Inspector General of Education of the time, Alphonse Dalou, uh, also a spiritualist philosopher. And it should not surprise us because, like I said, psycho research was controversial at the time. Dalou, uh, as Groguin and, um, and McGrath in Making a Spirit Matter show was quite important for Bergson at this time of his career. And thus we can imagine that he was not happy with such a young promising philosopher spending time doing these kinds of experiments. Now, in a footnote of his review of Fourier's Freedom and Determinism, in the next edition of the Revue, Dalou explains his uh, position in more detail and names Bergson. So here, he says that he had asked the editor of the Revue if he could discuss a question that has become pressing among the philosophers and the public, hypnotism. So can we hypnotize a person and uh, what are the ethical uh, considerations involved? So according to Dalou, the hypnotizers often make use of their authority and the subject's low social position to acquire uh, permission. And he adds, we should ask ourselves, can we really give someone the right to influence someone else's experiences, perceptions, memories, etc.? For Dalou, hypnosis is a practice that fundamentally uh, influences the psyche and the nervous system. And although it is useful in certain medical practices, uh, yeah, so think of Janin here, there are also non-medicals or amateurs who use hypnosis. And then he names Bergson who, according to him, even uses adolescent boys. Um, the interest of science, according to, to Dalou, serves here as a pretext for what results in fraudulent practices. And according to him, philosophers should not indulge in those practices, but should make us aware of the ethical problems involved. Yeah? So he asked, should we really sacrifice the inviolability of the human being? According to Dalou, these philosophers that I've cited are to judge. So we can imagine that Dalou, uh, so the inspector at, at the time publishes this in a, in a prominent journal. Bergson's name is there. He is explicitly told, okay, this is something that you should have second doubts about. We can imagine that Bergson was dissuaded from publishing further on the topic. Okay, so now the reception of this article. So Dalou was not the only one who commented on 
uh, this article, the next year Meyers, so he's one of the founders of the BSPR, after an exchange of letters with Bergson that I've unfortunately not been able to consult yet, wrote a two-page comment in the journal Mind, so that's in the right uh, corner. Um, he, 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 show, he, he tells his, uh, he gives his opinion on Bergson's experiments. So from the start, we should keep in mind that Meyers was uh, critical of Bergson because Bergson attacked his own findings, right? The critique that Bergson gave, so we can account for uh, telepathy with hyperesthesia, could also explain the findings of Meyers. Now, um, although Meyers asserts it is possible to read the page number in the cornea of someone on the other side of the room, like we've seen in the picture, he is more skeptical about, about the microscopic pictures, so the second experiment. He argues that eyes are simply not that sensitive. And I mean, we should admit that's true. We simply cannot read the page number of uh, some, uh, in the cornea of somebody on the other side of the room. You can try it at home if you want, but I think this is not possible. But by means of hypnosis, Mayus argues, the human eye of the hypnotized subject could have been transformed into a microscope. And I quote him, it seems then conceivable that hypnotic suggestion had induced by spasm of the ciliary muscle some change in the shape of the crystal on the lens, which made the eye a microscope for the time being. Yeah. So he has still a way to account for this. We do not know if Bergson endorses this, uh, this, this explanation. For that, I really need to consult the letters. So while Marius does read Bergson as a critique of psycho-researchers, Psycho research. There are others who actually cite him as evidence for a uh, parapsychological finding. So Janet quotes Bergson as evidence for the existence of a dissociated consciousness in his 8089 book Automatism. So that's the second. Then James, in Principles of Psychology, the first edition, uh, cites Bergson, and I quote, one of the most extraordinary examples of visual hyperesthesia is that reported by Bergson. And then uh, Josef Del Booth important psychologist at the time, also quotes Bergson, and interestingly, the, uh, the, the German materialist Ludwig Buchner also praises uh, Bergson's article in 1887. Yeah, so this was before uh, the publication of Bergson's first book, and most bibliographies of Bergson that I've seen do not give an account of these. Although I cannot discuss what they say about Bergson's article, it is clear, I think, from this that Bergson had a reputation among the community of psycho researchers before the publication of his first work. And in a way, there were, because these were widely read, Revue especially, that philosophers associated Bergson with psycho research before he was even known as a philosopher. Okay, so this is the first part of the historical background. Now I'll move 10 years ahead in time and discuss the seances of Eusapia Palladino. So in 1900, um, uh, there were some researchers in France who were attempting to create an institute similar to that of the BSPR. And uh, in 1900, 22 members came together, uh, 22 uh, researchers came together, among them, Bex, Bex, among them Bergson, Richet, and Janet, who wanted to, uh, to create such an institute like the BSPR. Now, the next year, uh, the IGP was founded and Bergson became a member of a study group devoted to, and I quote, to the exploration of the still undefined forces at the frontiers of psychology, biology, and physics. Yeah. So here you see the still undefined forces is uh, the study of still undefined forces is the aim of this study group of which Bergson was part, and we will see this expression return in his presidential address at the BSPR. And in addition, we here see that it is not simply situated in biology, this psycho research, but also uh, physics and psychology. So the interdisciplinary project is, is clear. Then in addition, Bergson was part of an exclusive secret club called the Club of 13 that met every Thursday to discuss psycho research. And among them was Emile Boirac and Eugène Osti, both prominent psycho researchers who discuss Bergson's work in relation to psycho research. And Bergson also discusses some of their work. Now, in 1905, the Institute began a project, uh, a three-year project with Palladino. Palladino was an Italian medium that was known for table turning and communication with the dead, but unsurprisingly, she had also been caught with some trickery during her seances. Yeah? 
So this this must be clear. Before she came to IGP, we she was already known for yeah fraud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Bergson attended four or six sessions. We're not sure, and he observed some supernatural phenomena. Uh, yeah, like I will, uh, and I will quote from an interview where he explicitly said that. So let me describe these seances. Eusapia, like we see on the right, would usually sit behind a curtain with only her hands visible, and then people had to wait for hours, and then sometimes some supernatural phenomena appeared. Paladino said, I cannot bring these phenomena about by sheer will. We have to have the right circumstances. Light had to be dimmed. People had to talk. And even then, like I said, it could take hours. But then sometimes the table began to levitate or one could see luminous dots and sparks. Now, as is hopefully clear from this the description, the, yeah, you had to be a little bit naive to really believe her. And like I've said, she, she had already been caught with some with fraud. So yeah, you can really ask some questions about the uh, the experiments. Um, okay, so although, like I said, Bergson, uh, no, like, uh, like, like me, Bergson is somewhat skeptical about the results of these seances, but he does eventually attest to the phenomena in an interview with Meunier. This is a long interview, Bergson rarely gave interviews. So it's it's also interesting to note that he gives an interview on this topic. And I quote from the interview, I've experimented little myself, and it is difficult to render an opinion in this matter. So psychophenomena, but, and this is important. However, it is at least possible to speak of certain spirit phenomena and particularly those which a celebrated medium Palladino produced. Okay, yeah, so this is the historical background. Now we're already, yeah, we have some information, we have enough background information to interpret uh, Bergson's presidential address at the BSPR. So I will give a reading of it. It will not be a, a full reading of every aspect. I cannot connect it to creative evolution, but I hope it gives enough food for discussion concerning vitalism and spiritualism. Now, uh, in this uh, lecture, Bergson explicitly connects his views on psycho research to his own philosophy. And he first begins by Ex, uh, by affirming his long-term interest in psycho-research, showing his admiration for the courage of psycho-researchers, given the prejudices and the critique that they already faced back at the beginning of the 20th century. And at this point, uh, Bergson also reacts to the cases of fraud that surrounded psycho-research. And I quote, when I think of all the precautions that you have taken to avoid error. And he also adds that given the evidence acquired, he still believes in telepathy. I am led to believe in telepathy, just as I believe in the defeat of the invincible Amara. Yeah, so that's on the right, the, the picture on the right. Now, for him, this is not the same certainty as uh, that of the physicist, but is the same certainty as we have in history and juridical matters. Now, according to Bergson, uh, there is a lack of progress in uh, psycho research, and this can be explained by an unconscious metaphysics that a lot of scientists have. We can see that this unconscious metaphysics is also the metaphysics that um, that he attacks in matter of memory and creative evolution. And at this point, he also gives a concise summary of his metaphysics that does uh, give uh, does help to uh, interpret and explain psychical research findings. So his summary is as follows: First, psychical parallelism is not suggested by the scientific facts. Two, when we know everything about the brain, we still know little about consciousness. Third, consciousness probably lives on after the death of the body. Now, he begins to expand on the function of the brain. And here we see hyperesthesia return. According to Bergson, the function of our brain is to keep our attention fixed on the world we live in and prepare us for action. In doing so, and I quote, it canalizes and it also limits the mental life. Because of this fil filtering function of the brain, as most Bergson scholars know, Bergson has a filtering function theory of the brain, so to say. He argues that we could perceive virtually many more things than we perceive actually. Now, this is something that he also says in matter and memory, but I think we should keep in mind Bergson's early work on the hyperesthesia here. So this is the kind of perceptions that he's talking about. Okay. Sorry, so, I interrupt you a second. Could you wrap up in two, three minutes or is that yeah. radically impossible? No, 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 I, I, I will make it. Thank you. Okay, so now, the second part, and here a lot of things come together. 
Um, now Bergson begins to describe, oh wait, sorry, uh, describe what kind of phenomena they are. And here we should keep in mind his uh, claims about telepathy and his claims about Palladino. Um, for him, there exists a fringe of perception, most often unconscious, but all ready to enter into consciousness and which do in fact enter in exceptional cases or in predisposed subjects. So I think predisposed subjects refer to hypnotized uh, subjects. And these perceptions of this kind, they are facts with which psycho researcher can and should concern itself. So here it is clear that for Bergson, these uh, phenomena are real and they are accessible near the fringe of our psyche. So the title of my talk. Um, now, here, now Bergson begins to wrap it up and then the connection with vitalism becomes especially apparent because he, he, yeah, he simply connects uh, it with his vitalism. So he expresses hope in the development of psycho research within science in general. And he said that if we had already had a Newton or Galileo of psycho research, we would have, and this is the first quote, a, sci a science that would have passed from pure mind to life. Yeah. So yesterday we had discussion, had a discussion about the life in connection to consciousness, but here we see that Bergson explicitly connects uh, his ideas about psycho research to the concept of life, so not only consciousness. And then, so the rest of the quote, a biology would have been constituted, but a vitalist biology, quite different from ours, which would have sought behind the sensible forms of living beings, the inward invisible force. So here, remember the aim of the study group of which Bergson was part. So the aim was to study those invisible forces. And here, I really wonder whether we can still conceive of this uh, as a image, right? He gives it the name of a force and also then uh, names it an energy. And then I think there are clear ontological ramifications. Um, and then he, uh, he concludes, so this is the last quote, by affirming, and here I want to connect this to what uh, Sebastian uh, said yesterday in relation to Thanos' presentation concerning medicine, Together with this vitalist biology, there would have arisen a medical practice, so it's also connected to medicine, which would have sought to remedy directly the insufficiencies of the vital force. And then healing by suggestion. So suggestion is a, is a technical term. We saw it in the quote of Tano uh, yesterday, but I would say that there, Bergson also refers to mental suggestion, and we could discuss this. Yeah, so he thinks that there, there could arise a medical practice that... Uh, that is characterized by an influence of mind on mind. Yeah, so the distinctions between mind appear, and for Bergson, they are due to um, a space. Uh, might have taken forms a proportion of which it is impossible for us to form the least idea, so would have been founded the science of mind energy. Okay, I'll leave it at that. So, brief conclusion Bergson was known for his psycho research long before being known as a philosopher. Um, although Bergson often does not discuss the two uh, in, in, in the same work, we can reconstruct the relation if we pay careful attention to history. And I think a reason why he did not do so himself is because it was simply a controversial topic. Remember the Ripperman by Dalu. So what can we conclude from this? Uh, I think that when Bergson speaks of life and when assessing his vitalism, we should keep in mind all the psychic connotations, the ramification of his belief in the continued existence of the soul, and his belief that minds can communicate through other senses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this very interesting talk, which I am sure will awake lots of questions, but we postpone the discussion just for now and give first the floor to um, Jack Hansen, our next speaker. Um, let me identify him here. On... Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, Jack, you are a PhD candidate in religious studies at Yale University. You received your MA at the University of Chicago and BA at Suffolk University, Boston. And your dissertation was titled Rituals of Reason. Uh, focusing on a series of philosophers of the 19th and 20th century who appeal to Catholicism. And your lecture will be about um, uh, vitalism and Catholicism, thinking through a counterculture. You have the floor, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, could I meet the co-host? Or should, am I able to share? 
Sorry, you don't have you don't have to be a co-host to, okay. to share. Oh, very good. It should yeah. work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can everybody see this? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, okay, very good. Um, I need to start with a couple of caveats. First, a very practical one. My internet went down this morning. Uh, can you put your presentation in presentation oh, mode? Yeah, sure. Which will make it easier to see. Yes. Thanks. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Um, better? Yes. So, yes. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so my internet went down this morning. I'm currently in the only room I could get into on campus. Um, and I've just been informed that I, I need to leave as soon as I can. So I'll be able to stay through the discussion and then I'll have to leave and come back. Um, the, the second uh, sort of disclaimer caveat I want to make um, is that I am uh, not a specialist in Bergson. And um, I began this research looking into um, these topics um, in part following a hunch about uh, how Bergson thinks and what was so important about Bergson to, to a, a group of, of thinkers in the early 20th century in France. Um, a hunch that I'm, I'm happy to say was confirmed yesterday by the um, extraordinary uh, presentation yesterday um, on um, by Tona, who's, uh, who's, who, who's interested in, in, in the Elan Vital as an image um, and, and the addendum made by Paul Antoine about uh, Bergson's innovation of, of, of uh, open uh, recursion uh, really just made me ashamed of the sort of stumbling argument that I was trying to make in, in my paper. So I spent the night uh, trying to uh, incorporate those insights uh, and mostly ended up staying awake too late and kind of mangling the structure of my argument. So. Uh, I have a sort of new focus, uh, still the same title, Thinking Through a Counterculture, Bergson Among the Catholics. Um, but rather than trying to suss out what has now been sort of um, carefully uh, confirmed, uh, I'm going to tell a story about a, a, a particular um, implication of that, of that claim um, having to do with um, well, so I'll just start then. Um, so this, uh, these reflections are part of a larger project, uh, still in its infancy, focused on Catholicism and the Catholic as a site of contestation in philosophical modernity. I'm interested in the cultural logic of displacement in the post-Enlightenment West, being at once bound inextricably to Protestant Christianity which most scholars in my field of religious studies understand to be the uh, repressed progenitor and analytic blueprint of secularity, and equally the primary object of excision from that paradigm. So this logic of simultaneous affiliation and disavowal appears in a variety of contexts, the particularly vivid one being the controversies surrounding Bergson's thought in Belle Epoque, France, which resulted in 1914 in the official condemnation by the Vatican of time and duration uh, matter and memory and creative evolution. In what follows, I will focus primarily on this event as explored by Bergson's student and friend, the philosopher, poet, and anti-clerical Catholic, Charles Peggy, uh, who finds in the official Catholic condemnation uh, of Bergson an event uniquely amenable to a Bergsonian reading. Uh, for Peggy, Bergson's thought represented a revolution in the history of modernity which would allow for the destabilization of rigid taxonomies that had migrated from their places of origin in mechanistic natural science into the whole of culture, not least religious culture. In Bergson's unique terminological suppleness, to use Peggy's word, a new interrogation of the supposed line between faith and reason became possible. This innovation for Peggy is proven by its negative reception among the establishment of the day insofar as it produces an unsustainable, yet for that reason, heuristic dichotomy requiring new conceptual navigation. He writes, quote, Bergson has against him all those he has ruined. He has against him those who owe him everything. He continues, that's good, it's right. Before coming to what I think he means by that and what it offers for the implications of Bergson's thought, I want to outline a brief historical overview. Um, 
By the time of Bergson's condemnation, the church had been waging a war on modernity for over a century. Still reeling in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, the church found a new enemy in enlightenment as defined by Kant, predicated as it was on the rejection of tradition and authority and the veneration of the individual's rational capacity. In the various political and intellectual upheavals of the 19th century, which the Vatican took to be of a piece with the Enlightenment project progressed, the church recast itself as a sub or counterculture with efforts to reinvigorate what it viewed as the traditional, specifically medieval elements of the faith, such as Marian devotion, lay associations, and most importantly for my purposes, an intellectual patrimony rooted in the writings of Thomas Aquinas. This neo-Thomism, Thomas, excuse me, uh, manifested itself not so much in the production of great thinkers as an increased central control over Catholic intellectual life. Even philosophers and theologians now venerated, even sainted, such as John Henry Newman, came under suspicion by the Vatican. But perhaps no one was as vociferously, vociferously attacked as those Catholics who attempted to incorporate modern innovations, such as critical historical biblical scholarship, or liberal parliament, parliamentary politics into the faith. This tendency known pejoratively as modernism came to be thought not without paranoia as an insidious sect within the church, sparking a vendetta that climaxed in Pope Pius X's pictured here celebrating mass, uh, official condemnation of the modernist heresy in 1907. And the 1910 introduction of an anti-modernist oath to be taken by all Catholic priests. And you can see in this quotation I have here, the resonances with, um, with some of the key terms that we've been discussing. But you can also see that it's not especially philosophically rigorous. Um, agnosticism uh, is, uh, this is a quotation from uh, the encyclical condemning modernism. Uh, agnosticism is, the, is only the negative part of the system of the modernist. The positive side of it consists in what they call vital Im imminence. Religion, whether natural or supernatural, must, like every other fact, admit of some explanation. But when natural theology has been destroyed, the road to revelation closed through the rejection of the arguments of credibility and all external revelation absolutely denied, it is clear that this explanation will be sought in vain outside man himself. It must therefore be looked for in man. And since religion is a form of life, the explanation must certainly be found in the life of man. Hence, the principle of religious imminence is formulated. Um, anyone, as you all are more than me, that familiar with the history of vitalism, uh, and especially the more philosophically serious aspects of that history, um, knows that this is an utter caricature. But I think uh, it is intentionally so um, in order to draw people both into Thomism and to be ashamed of being associated uh, with any of these terms vital, eminence, et cetera. Um, so th these uh, philosophical um, debates, if you can call them that, are as political and uh, socio-historical as they are anything else. Um, now, meanwhile, in the decade prior to these dramatic proclamations, another tendency had arisen among young intellectuals who were either Catholic or Catholic adjacent, especially in Paris. Almost irrespective of the church's war on modernism, it was a time of enormous revival in interest, of interest uh, in Catholicism among French intellectuals. And with the publication of Matter and Memory and his ascendancy to the ENS, Bergson came to represent a means of navigating between both reactionary Catholicism and what they understood to be, quote, pseudo-scientific positivism, uh, typified by uh, Littre, for example, as Raisa Maritain put it, um, of literary, historical, uh, and philosophical academic life. Above all, what attracted these students uh, was what they took in Bergson to be a new way of accessing the absolute in thought, and so providing a new foundation for a rapprochement between theology and philosophy. By the second decade of the century, however, the reception of, of Bergson among Catholics had shifted. The establishment of the church, always wary of the perceived affinity between Bergson and modernism, began to visit, vigorously investigate his influence among the youth after an explosion in popularity of his work following the 1907 publication of Creative Evolution. 
Meanwhile, some of those who had once been disciples of Bergson's turned against their former teacher. Perhaps most consequential of these apostates, as it were, was Jacques Maritain, whose first major text was 1913's La Philosophie Bergsonienne, a strident attack on Bergson, which characterized the thought he had once found so invigorating as an inadequate system that invoked the absolute as a smokescreen for its devaluation of the intellect. Sort of classic neo um, rhetoric of the time, and, and, and he had fallen under the influence of an especially uh, energetic uh, manualist theologian. Um, Henri Massis, uh, another former student of Bergson, was perhaps even more responsible for the final turning of the tide against Bergson among Catholic intellectuals. After his own conversion, Massif was the anonymous author under the pen name Agathon of Les Jeunes Gens d'Aujourd'hui uh, in 1913, one of several quasi-sensationalist enquête into the intellectual lives of students under the influence of Bergson that was published in the popular press. Of particular interest is Massif's assessment that Bergson's influence was primarily a negative one and that his real force was simply to allow young followers to break decisively with materialism. As again, Raisa Maritain puts it, uh, Bergson's influence had passed from the philosophical field to the field of religion and dogma. Bergson's young followers thus made the position of religious modernism rest on a seductive philosophical basis. The Agathon enquête had revealed the tendencies of an important group of young intellectuals who fervently embraced the doctrines of Le Roi, a student of Bergson, uh, uh, La Bretonnière, and of Maurice Blondel. Uh, the relationship between all of these thinkers uh, is complex. Um, and to, and uh, as usual with anti-modernist rhet rhetoric, uh, this groups together people um, unjustly and un un indefensibly, finally. Um, indefensibly, excuse me. Um, such a denun denunciation, combined with the less surprising attacks of anti Semites like Charles Morat and L'Action Francaise, provide a solid ground for ecclesial authorities to begin official proceedings of Bergson's condemnation. The decree, which came in June of 1914, declared Bergson's then published text anathema, describing his doctrine of freedom as particularly dangerous in that it was predicated not on the rational alignment of one's soul with the will of God, but rather a spontaneous exercise of choice, which without a horizon of transcendence becomes indistinguishable from determinism and fatalism. Um, we heard yesterday several of the many available refutations of this assessment, um, but it's worth noting that these indictments chime remarkably well with those made by earlier Christians, uh, such as Jacobi, uh, against Spinoza during the so-called pantheism controversy, which also directly preceded a Catholic revival. I just leave that as a free association. Um, now, at the center of these developments was Peggy, who in 1907 returned to his boyhood Catholicism after over a decade as a very public atheist and socialist. But while many of his friends and peers made conversions that included a repudiation of Bergson as well as a rightward political turn, Peggy remained both a socialist, if one estranged from the mainstream of left politics, and an ardent admirer of Bergson, whose defense he took up with renewed vigor in the face of such overwhelming hostility. He makes his case in two essays, Note on Bergson and the Bergsonian Philosophy, and the much longer conjoined note on Descartes and the Cartesian philosophy, which was left unfinished at the time of his death in the first months of the First World War. The first essay is shorter and more direct, directly polemical, the second a whirlwind of illusion, digression, and lyric. He leaves much to be desired in the way of recognizable conceptual precision and explicit citation. Instead, he makes of these essays, the second even more than the first, a performance of what he finds most valuable in Bergson's thought. This is not to say that he doesn't make arguments in his way against Massy's claim that Bergson's importance was merely critical, merely negative. Peggy writes, to unchain human beings, to prevent, to disabiduate human beings from sliding down certain mental slopes, certain slopes of thought, if only one succeeded, let us be convinced that there we would have, we have had 
material, the object of a very great logic, a very great morality, a very great metaphysics. The French Revolution was an operation, an enormous historical event, because it seemed to unchain the world from a seeming political servitude. And finally, the whole immense apparatus of the incarnation and redemption, was it not set up in order to unchain human beings, in order to prevent them from remaining fallen into enslavement? And I almost want to say, into the habit of original sin, for sin had become, above all, an immense habit. And slavery is, so to speak, the most natural habit. What Bergson provides for Peggy, above all, is a style of thinking, or method, perhaps being too wrapped up with the metaphysical order that had become a habit, and so incapable of articulating the change, which is an ineradicable aspect of life. Apart from simply defending Bergson from attacks being made against him, Peggy's deeper concern is to show that what he takes to, to show what he takes to be the full implications of Bergson's metaphysical insights. In, most, in more explicitly critical moments, he takes up the Bergsonian term ready-made to faith and argues that in defining itself counterculturally as, quote, the party of the devout, Bergson's Catholic accusers are in fact the long-term participants in the metaphysical project inaugurated by Descartes and therefore have as little in common with the medieval Christianity they claim to uphold as the determinism they insist Bergson vouchsafes into Catholic intellectual life. May I just interrupt you and ask you whether you can give it another three, four minutes? Uh, yes, that should be okay. Okay. I just have two more slides, I believe. I'll go quickly. Um, but more important than this imminent critique, and I won't read these enormous quotes, um, more important than this imminent critique is the more positive, if less determined project of which it is a part and to which it ultimately gives way. Taking inspiration from Bergson's use of heuristic dualisms, as for example, between idealism and realism in the introduction of matter and memory, uh, Peggy explores a variety of oppositions, from Christian and pagan in Corneille to Louis IV and Philippe Le Bel, in order not to take sides or even weigh their respective merits, but rather to show the exhausting, not to say exhaustive repetition, the inevitability of the emergence of new terms which do not simply eradicate prior oppositions, but rather transform the structure of their relation such that they fully reveal, more fully reveal the aspects of the real which they had come to cover over. Where Peggy Bergson surpasses Descartes and all other philosophical systems, not because he offers a superior system of categorization, but because he provides the means for the generation of terms which open onto their own overcoming. But this is not a dialectical overcoming since for Peggy, Bergson provides a way of thinking holistically, which is to say, of retaining even inadequacies and failures within a more adequate, more successful articulation. So this is where I would have read uh, this long quotation about habit. Um, now for Peggy speaking as a Catholic, Bergson offers a new way of understanding Catholic self-articulation. But there's not a hint of triumphalism or supersession in this offering. Instead, to reiterate, it provides only a new mode of relation, or more to the point, a new capacity for the continual renegotiation of relation. Uh, and this is my uh, final slide. Uh, it is impossible to quote Peggy adequately. He runs on for hundreds of pages, turning over minute variations on themes until they seem utterly exhausted, only to turn without warning onto another theme, perhaps linking the two together dozens of pages later, perhaps not. His point in this exercise of recursion is to show the coincidence of rigidity and spontaneity or suppleness, and to demonstrate the crucial importance of a style of thinking that not only articulates what it can account for, but builds into those categorizations the possibility of a new understanding that has yet to be reached. These essays are therefore not simply defenses of Bergson, they are attempts at an exercise of the Bergsonian style, attempts which met with the, with the approval of Bergson himself, if only in private. A persistent condition of their friendship was the stable if somewhat uneasy coexistence of Bergson's reserve with Peggy's daring, to put it politely. By taking this style into realms Bergson never went, Peggy also means to show the centrality of the philosopher's insight into what is perhaps the defining feature of modernity, namely 
the naming of history. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, now we have about 20 minutes uh, time for discussion. So I give you the floor. I see whether there are questions. Can you see, uh, can everyone see the questions from the Q&R? Or, um, yeah, so I think we can, but uh, maybe we should read it because I'm not sure that, uh, I think it's just us that sees it. I'm okay, sure. let me start with the question by Hisashi Fujita. Thank you, Thais and Johan. I agree totally with your conclusion too. Writing myself on, a, on this topic in comparison with Freud's metapsychology, I have so many things to say, so do I. But let me stress it only this. I think that this attitude of not being afraid of parascientific subjects and trying to deal philosophically with the problems of telepathy and hypnosis up to the very edge is essential to Bergson's philosophy. It is present not only when dealing with the problems of mysticism in two sources, but also already when dealing with the problems of vitalism in creative evolution, with the problems of pure memory in matter and memory, and with the of duration. One of the proofs, the notion of suggestion, plays an important role for all of Bergson's philosophy. So perhaps Thies and Elant is back. Uh, you might to want to intervene here. Um, yeah, yeah, I could just say that I agree and that it's important that we see that uh, uh, words like suggestion uh, and but also sympathy, which is an important concept of Bergson's philosophy, have a history in the 19th century. They come from psychical research. And when Bergson uses these terms, suggestion and sympathy, we should keep in mind that he is referring to these discussions. Yeah. And that can really help us because if you just simply use control F and go through Bergson's work with suggestion, you see that he uses it a lot. And when he, he also uses a lot of examples where there are hypnotized subjects. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. what I have to say. We perhaps should not forget that uh, Freud um, uh, read James also, right? If I'm not, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are interesting connections indeed with metapsychology, I fully agree. I would like to talk to you about it later. But there's a question from Bruno. Thank you. Thank you both for amazing presentations. Uh, actually, I have questions for both. So uh, for Thiers and Johan, uh, I would like to ask like, two questions, one more general and one more specific. Uh, the more general question is, uh, what, what do you think are the reasons for this? Because if, for example, if you read the, the, the book from Grogan, The Bergsonian Controversy, he stated this occultist revival, all of that. So do you think it's, it's related to that or has another specific reason? I don't know. Do you think this fascination with the occult, it's more like a irrational tendency or is more like a rational tendency to rationalize uh, hidden subjects of mind and life? And so what, because it's also the, the age of science, the age of technical innovations, so how do you think of this kind of, you know, uh, ambiguity in this uh, researches? Another question is, is more specific because in the, in the passage that you co quoted uh, uh, about when Bergson states the, in, the, in the text, uh, Phantom of the, of the Livings, uh, when he states uh, this healing capacity uh, by suggestion, if you read the critical edition, uh, I don't know who did, uh, but they say that it's it's related to uh, psychotherapy, and I think it's completely misleading the sub because it's it's more like suggestion, right? Like telepathy and and spiritual suggestion. So what do you think of that? And and because it's quite extravagant, right? So that would be the questions for for, for Tiers and and Johan, and for um, sorry, I forgot the Jack. name. Uh, Jack. Uh, Jack. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So for Jack, amazing topic too, uh, really interesting. Uh, my question would be like, I don't know if you were aware of the, the, the correspondence between Bergson and the father uh, Tokedek about immanence and transcendence. Of, I, always, I always thought that this letter is really weird because it's like Bergson is denying 
his immanentist tendency is stated in Credit Revolution to a priest. So I don't know, what do you think? You think it's more related to philosophical reasons like the rejection of the doctrine of Spinoza or Spinozism, or it is more like, because at, at the end of the discussion with the father, with, with the priest, he agrees with him, with, with the priest, right? He said, no, my, my, the creation that I, I'm stating is a transcendental creation. So do, do you think this is due more to a um, philosophical question like denying of Spinozism as a doctrine, philosophical doc doctrine? Or do you think it's more like for uh, uh, religions, theological reasons to be more aligned with Catholicism because Bergson was a Jew and he was, he, he, he tried to be uh, converted, but then he denied the conversion. So what do you think of this? So this will be my three questions. Thank you very much. Perhaps Dees first and then Jack? Oh, maybe Jack can go first? Oh, oh um, as well. <laughs> Jack, go on. Okay. Uh, it, well, yeah, good question. As I say, I'm not a specialist in Bergson, so I, I'm happy to be corrected on, on these points. Um, but yeah, I, I am familiar with that and also with the sort of general outline of, of Bergson's personal move toward and then slightly away from Catholicism. Um, and there's some suggestion that he did finally make a deathbed conversion, but who knows about those? Um, at bottom, I think it is, this is something that Peggy is pushing on, which is um, that the conceptual equipment to describe the uh, middle way is the wrong word, but the, 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 the navigation that Bergson wants to affect between transcendence and eminence in this context is not yet available. Um, it's been thoroughly eradicated um, by neo-Thomism and, and also by the, the sort of long history of, of modern philosophy, uh, especially in its prevailing mechanism, as it were. Um, and I think the term that comes to be used much more frequently and is, it is now, um, and has been for 20 or 30 years, a sort of hot topic in, in Catholic theology is the question of participation. And so the extent to which there's a, um, the distinction between transcendence and eminence is a false one. Um, there are links to, I mean, uh, so the, yeah, the last thing that I'll say is that the, to frame the question as a, whether it's a philosophical problem or a theological problem is sort of precisely the problematic that Peggy sees Bergson as helping us overcome um, because it has roots both in Descartes and in say Luther's doctrine of total depravity where there's an utter disjunction between creator and created. The Catholic vision is a much more attenuated division. Okay. Please. Yeah, so I'll start with the second question concerning uh, the relation to psychotherapy, or at least what is in the critical edition. Yeah, I think, in a way, there isn't a lot of research yet on uh, psycho research in France at the time. I'll, although there are some, and I think in the last couple of years, there have appeared some good books, Unruly Spirits, etc., etc. But um, I think what for me really helped is reading uh, Ian Hacking's Rewriting the Soul as a description of the period in which Bergson was educated and at which he received his education, right? That book, I, I, I think a lot of us have read it, uh, Historians of uh, Science, but I don't think that everyone sees that this is also the period in which Bergson is working. Um, and then, yeah, you can start to make these connections to Janet, etc., etc. And then concerning the first more general question, yeah, that's that's a yeah, it's a huge question which is very much related to my broader project, so psychologism, um, where I think because of industrial revolution, because of the progress of science, we see a kind of revolt, right? It's been named a revolt against positivism, and I think in a way we should see these. Uh, these projects of psycho research as part of that revolt. So as a as a way to kind of deal with the disenchantment of, of life. Yeah, there's much else I could say, but that's just, I'll leave it at that. Other questions? Perhaps. 
perhaps I can ask a small question about um, the first thing, uh, Tis, what you have been talking about made me think of um, the relation between Swedenborg and Kant, as if there was there's something you have to go through in order to arrive at a certain point. Um, the second uh, thing is about the uh, history of psychoanalysis. Um, and indeed, it rejoins a little bit with the other talk, because uh, the Jewish background of Freud and then the Catholic background of uh, Lacan. And I wasn't aware, I must admit, that um, that period, uh, the beginning of the 20th century in France, had that whole uh, debate on Catholicism and, and well, that revival, like, frankly, I didn't know it, but some of my colleagues in psychoanalysis did tell me that um, the, the background of Lacan is uh, Catholic. And um, so just these two things, um, and in relation to uh, suggestion, Freud was um, had started from this idea of suggestion, and at one point came to see that uh, in psychotherapy, uh, he said at a certain point when um, the patient accepts what you suggest, you can be sure it's not correct. <laughs> so he adopted the kind of inverse. Um, method in psychotherapy you cannot trust the fact that the, the fact that the patient accepts what you say as to the truth of what you're saying even as if there is something to say about the truth of the fact that he's accepting it that's another thing you know that's the whole issue of transference so um uh, there are too many things and and i have to i i would like to uh, I'm, i would like to continue cooperate with both of you in, in relation to that being interested in psychoanalysis and I think there are in interesting parallels. So it's not really a question. Yeah, but yeah, I can say something real brief. So I think Charcot and the debate between the two schools on hypnosis is yeah, one of the connecting links. Mm -hmm. Because in his uh, lectures on psychology at Clermont, uh, Bergson refers to this debate where he says that hypnotism is or a hypnotized person is like the opposite of freedom it's really interesting that he defines it that way and of course we should keep in mind that these lectures do not represent his own philosophy but it is interesting that he, he refers to that so hypnotism opposed to free will and then i think you could connect that to his first book where freedom of course plays a central role yeah yeah okay Thank you. If there are no further questions, I su suggest we have a small break. Would it be okay till 4.30, right? I, I had a, just a small question, if there is still time. I raised my uh, yellow oh, sorry. hand. Sorry, sorry, Mathilde, come on. Um, no, uh, I have a question uh, for you both, uh, Juan and Chess. Uh, I, I don't know if you can answer it. It's, a, it's an actual question I hide uh, myself, and I'm wondering if you had any hypothesis about that. But you quoted uh, this very um, surprising text. For me, it's a surprising text, Phantoms of, uh, of the Living, right, in, uh, in English, Phantom de Vivant. And I, I always wonder why Bergson, uh, in this text, that is in a philosophical essay, uh, uses the psychological uh, and psychic, uh, um, not only vocabulary, but I, I mean, the sh it's not the same perspective as in his other uh, essays, uh, philosophical essays. It's not so much about intuition. It's about, I told it just a bit uh, yesterday about the soul and not the consciousness. And I'm always wondering, it's very interesting though, but why did you decide, uh, and you explained the context was very complicated uh, around this experiment. So why did you decide to put this weird text <laughs> in uh, mind energy? And by weird, did you understand what I mean? Uh, relatively um, with the other text. So, well, if you have an hypothesis on that, I'm... Uh... Oh, yeah, that's a very difficult question. Yeah, so, yeah, he, he really wavers between accepting psycho research, and this is quite triumphant, this this lecture, or at least he sketches what psycho research can be and connects it to his philosophy. I don't know, maybe he, what I, yeah, 
this is this is just purely a sentiment. I have the feeling that because he had already uh, ha he established his uh, uh, his reputation at that time, and it kind of enabled him to yeah to make that gesture. It's not really an answer to your question, but I don't have a fully developed feel on that. Thank you. Okay. There are no questions in the camera. Okay. So I suggest we have a small break now.